everyone. This is Bill, and I'm your host, Brittany Jones Cooper. The film Bohemian Rhapsody traces the rise of Queen through their iconic songs and revolutionary sound. They reach unparalleled success, but after frontman Freddie Mercury leaves the group to start a solo career, the band's fate is in jeopardy. Today, I'll be joined by actors Gwilym Lee, Joe Mazzello, and Alan Leach to discuss the film. But first, here's a trailer from Bohemian Rhapsody. Together for Gwilym Lee, Joe Mazzello, and Alan Leach. Is it weird if I to start just by going, hey oh <laughs> Well, the crowd's got to respond then. That's the way it works. oh No, it doesn't. It only works when Freddie Mercury does it, unfortunately. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, we need mustaches. Maybe it'll My work. first question to you guys is very serious. Do you miss wearing the wigs? <laughs> no. Um, it, it was uh, every day I used to look forward. I, I could cope with it every day. It would be fine. And then when I was told that, you know, sat down in that chair and it would be 10 minutes before getting it off. I'd just be like, get it off now, get it off now, get it off. I'd just get claustrophobic. And then it would come off and just steam would rise up off my head. And I'd just probably like scratch my head for about half an hour after that. Joe? Yeah, you know, there's so many pins too, like that they kind of stick in there that like every morning it's just like, ow, ow, <laughs> yeah, yeah. ow, ow. But you're too tired to really complain about it. And um, they also... Well, semi permed your hair. Semi permed. Oh, you can't fully perm. Fully permed. It was perm permed. Yeah. It was double permed. You I guys think. really sacrificed for your craft then. Sure did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the biggest sacrifice I've ever had. <laughs> no. It was a. It was very funny because I. I'm so stupid. I didn't realize what a perm was. I didn't realize that stood for permanent. Uh, so when it was given to me. Um, I was like, so this will like wash out in like seven to 10 days. And they're like, no, 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 no. And then as it grew in with straight hair, it kind of like comes out and then forms this sort of like perm halo <laughs> around you. That is the least flattering thing I've ever seen. I have pictures that you will not put up on Instagram of me with that horrible. Well, well we just have to see what Instagram wants. <laughs> if Instagram wants it. Whenever we went out as a, as a cast, away from the set. Every time that Joe took off his hat, he would turn to whoever was looking at him going, this isn't my normal hair. Yeah. This isn't my normal well, hair. Well, he would take it off my head. I'd be like talking to somebody, like, hey, how's it going? Yeah, and he'd just take the, my hat off, just be like, he's got a perm. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, well, that makes me love the film even more. I got to see it last week and it was such a ride and it's such a big film. And I know you guys have gotten to see it now. So what was your first experience seeing it and how did that feel? We, uh, it was Joe, myself, Rami, and Lucy went to go and see it in a, a cinema in, in Soho in London. Uh, and it was a very early cut. It was one of the first cuts. And um, we were just like, you know, sometimes you watch your own work and it can be like quite uncomfortable and you're watching it quite critically and seeing how things have changed and seeing how scenes have been cut. And, you know, it can be quite a, ho a horrible experience sometimes. <laughs> but um, I would say within five minutes, I was just completely taken in with it. And I felt like just in for the ride. And uh, I remember just sitting next to Joe when like the Bohemian Rhapsody music video came up and just, you know, leaping off our seats and just waving our hands in the air, cheering that we were just, you know, part of such an iconic scene, such a kind of well-known moment. It was quite a thrill, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, no, that was, we had the same experience seeing it for the first time. So it was, it was nerve wracking. It was, you know, you're definitely like, watching for the accent, watching for the moves, watching, you know what I mean? Just, it's your sort of dissecting your performance and, you know, just, it's just anxiety ridden because you can't change anything at that point. Like it's over, <laughs> you have no power. And so you're watching it just going like, <laughs> like making faces along with <laughs> like yourself to like make sure that you're not totally embarrassing yourself. Like that's the first run, right? You're like, did I embarrass myself? Okay, no, now I can enjoy the film. Um, but in this, watching this movie, it was different because we just got so into it so immediately. I had such yeah. a different experience because I was lucky enough, obviously I'm not in the band, but I got to watch these guys create these characters and then perform on the side where, as the cameras captured their performances. And then I got to watch it again. So I felt almost like I was an audience member for a lot of it. And uh, then watching it all put together, it's just such a celebration of Queen and what they achieved musically. And, and I just felt, as I said, like I felt like an audience member getting to watch it. And then I remember that I was in it. Yeah. yeah. I suppose more nerve wracking was the day that we knew Brian and Brian May and uh, Roger Taylor were in a, in a cinema room watching it. And that was pretty nerve wracking. We waited with bated breath to hear their response. And then v very quickly after they'd come out of the theater, um, Brian May had sent around personal emails to all of us with his response, which was, you know, that was the most important thing to us in this whole thing was trying to do justice to their stories. 
and to do justice to like, you know, the legacy of Queen and, and to the fandom. So to get his approval was like, that was the greatest endorsement. We I would imagine that makes a role that much more difficult is when the person is still living and you want them to be proud of your work. In your case, Brian May seemed to be very involved in the project and you, you play him on the big screen. So what sort of tips did he give you in sort of capturing his Brian-ness? <laughs> Um, you know, he, he was incredibly generous with his time um, and he would give me really specific tips sometimes about, you know, uh, about playing the guitar and, you know, he used to play with an old uh, sixpence, like an old British coin and he'd give me tips about like how he'd strike the string with what angle of the coin he'd do that with and what different pickup combinations he'd use on his guitar. But then also it's just more generally being able to spend time with him and get to know him as a human being and break down this, I was a Queen fan growing up. I you know, I was starstruck when I first met Brian um, when we were rehearsing this film and the opportunity to just demystify this icon and get to know him as a human being, that was the greatest, uh, that was the greatest resource, uh, you know, preparing for a character, but also the greatest privilege as well. He also gave you a leather jacket I saw. He was, he gave, I don't still have it. I'm right, to, just to wear. But he, uh, he came on set when we were, we started the whole shoot with Live Aid. He came on set and um, had a little look through the costumes that we'd had prepared for the film. And he was like, oh, I, you know, I've got a few that I can add to this. So we invited Julian Day, our costume designer, who's a genius. And he said, just come over to my house and just take your pick. So, um, yeah, he went and had a number of outfits, not least that, you know, yeah. white bomber jacket that, with shoulder pads that are about as wide as I am tall. Um, but there was a number of uh, clothes in it, which gave it just a real sense of authenticity and so exciting to have the privilege to wear those clothes. Yeah, yeah. John, you play, or Joe, you play John Deacon, and he's kind of not in the spotlight. He doesn't really like to be involved in things. And so how did you sort of find out who he was so that you could do that role justice? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there were times where I was definitely jealous on set um, of this guy and and of Ben um, because they got to like you know meet the men that they're playing and have you know get their insight, their very personal insight. But that was sort of also what was wonderful about about Brian is that he could have easily just said, "Well, I'm going to focus on Gwill because that's who I'm playing. I want to make sure this is perfect." And but he was so selfless, and he just said, "No, I want I want to be a resource for everybody. I want to." help everyone, and, and I think he also felt, for me a little bit, that it's like, well, you know, I have to be there for Joe as well to give him insight about, you know, John and about the band and about certain, even like just small details of things that he would do on stage that maybe I couldn't see from concert footage, and he would make sure to like give me those little tips. Like, he was always there um, to give a helping hand, um, and so that was, probably the greatest resource. And then there's just YouTube. I mean, YouTube is like unbelievable. I'm so thankful we got to make this movie when we did in the age of the internet because you can actually watch concerts and they have the camera that's, it's the John Deacon camera. And you can watch a three hour set and see every single thing that John Deacon does for every song. And like that was really helpful for me to like learn a lot of the movements and the way he presents himself on, on stage. Um, and then, you know, you do have, there's interviews, but interviews are tough because interviews are sort of the version that he's putting of himself out there rather than the more intimate moments. And so it's those intimate moments where I had to rely on um, Brian and Roger um, chiefly for those, yeah. It's, it's funny you say that because there's a scene where uh, he's very quiet, but then he kind of speaks up and is like, guys. Yeah. And I could see that probably coming from him saying like he was sort of the voice of reason in those moments. But that could only probably come from a bandmate who knew. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, it was it was great to have sort of the insight on the arguments and who kind of took what side and where everybody fell and like who kind of butted heads with who. Um, it was uh, getting those insights was actually just really fun, just as like a as a fan as much as it was for like you know a, a sort of character study. But it's also something. There's something to be said about the fact that John does have such a private life now. And after Freddie's death, he was very affected by that and just said, you know, I'm going to sort of leave Queen there. Like, he, he wrote our producer a congratulations about the movie when we first started. So he supports us from afar. He just doesn't want that limelight. And, and you can even take something from that and put it in the character and put it in some of these scenes when you see how he's affected by Freddie and things like that. So you try to, you, even from his absence, you can draw something from that as an actor. And Alan, you play Paul Prenter, who Freddie in the movie describes as villainy. And I would have yeah. to say, you nailed the villaininess. I mean, I did not like you during most of the thank film. Thank you very much. But I, that's a huge compliment. No, no thank um, you. So naturally for you, Alan. It's <laughs> yeah. weird. So how did you dig into your character? Because, again, he's not living anymore. No, he's um, not. He, di he died uh, 
about eight months before yeah. Freddie of AIDS related illness as well. And uh, there isn't very much footage of him. And a lot of, you know, because he was such a divisive character within the world of Queen and Freddie's life that people tend to not, not speak about him, that, that, you know. So trying to find any information on him was quite difficult. I mean, you can, you, I read all the books and found and referenced that. And there's a, there's a great uh, documentary called The Great Pretender. And he's in that a bit, and uh, you can, and it was off that. And watching it, the first thing that hit me about that documentary is he's just always just on Freddie's shoulder. Yeah. He was always just behind him, whispering in his ear, you know, bringing people to Freddie. But he was always kind of that that person, that that little malevolence in a way. And whilst it's written like that in the script, you also have to be aware that this person did exist and live. And I don't think that everyone was. 100% evil, so uh, I think th the decisions he made were uh, due to his circumstances at the time, and uh, I hope that while I know you probably hated me in it, <laughs> there is at least a moment when you think, oh, well, he's quite a lonely character, which I think Paul Prenter was. Yeah, I think you did humanize him in that way, where you think maybe he was trying to do the best he knew how, yeah. and that was misconstrued or maybe came off as different than what he intended. Yeah, I think as well, Freddie and, and, and Paul were two very lonely people. And they, and they were both, at the time, closeted about their sexuality. And they found a confidant in each other. And then that gave Paul power over Freddie and over the band because he was the person that Freddie would turn to. And uh, I think he used that power possibly in the wrong way. Yeah. On uh, Freddie's sexuality, what would you guys say to some people who say that maybe it was a little too sanitized in this film, that they wanted more of that in the storyline? It, Freddie never wanted to be defined. Uh, well, you know, I'm not speaking on Freddie's behalf. I don't want to speak yeah. on Freddie's behalf. But just we always we felt that he never wanted to be a poster boy for one specific thing. He didn't want to be known for being a gay man, just a gay man, or just an AIDS victim, or just um, you know an immigrant. You know, that's just as much a part of his story. And you know, it's I think it would be too simplified to just make it focus on one thing. He's a complicated man and like his whole story is trying to struggle with that complicated identity and that's what's interesting it's not straightforward it's it's this rich and complex life that um you know that he struggled with throughout uh his life is is what we kind of wanted to portray and equally you know um it's you know that we we reference drug taking and promiscuous lifestyle but we don't want that to be the focus either we want it to be a kind of celebration of his his life rather than like uh concentrating on this illicit story i think yeah yeah i think that the movie really tells the truth about freddie mercury's life you know it's not the only thing that's missing is like a, a graphic sort of element there's nothing that's not there and it is true that you know he had uh, Mary Austin in his life, who was, you know, his fiance, yeah, his fiance for a while, and then when he, he was, but he was struggling with his sexuality, and he has, you know, really positive gay relationships in the film and some bad ones, and he has moments of deep sadness and loneliness, and you know, where he is living life too hard, and you see all of those things, but that doesn't mean that you have to like see something that, like, we all get it, right? Like, as long as you know what's there and know what's happening, it's not like we are washing over that part of his life, like it didn't exist. It's just that we want it to be a celebration. You know, Queen was always for everyone. And so to make, like, a hard R sort of film would have sort of betrayed, I think, the, the legacy of who Queen was. They always wanted to play to the masses, to the, to the most number of people, to bring in the most people as possible. And so it was a balance of trying to make a PG-13 film where you get everything in there, but at the same time, you don't harp on any salacious detail. And we've got to talk about Rami's performance. Uh, he really transformed into Freddy. So what was that like for you guys watching him flip that switch and turn into Freddie Mercury. It's great. I mean, I've, I've known Rami for 11 years. We worked together uh, a decade ago on a show called The Pacific. And so I have known for a very long time that Rami Malek is a very skilled actor. Um, he is excellent. And so when I found out he got the role, I was like, oh, he's going to dominate it. Um, but it, there was something about him putting in those teeth and the mustache and like the nose prosthetic and suddenly it was weird. It, it just sort of like, you got chills, just like how it blew you away, how you felt like 
and, it, and I felt that way for actually everyone. You know, I felt that way for when this guy puts on the wig and, you know, puts on the Brian face and this sort of thoughtfulness. It was just like, I remember the camera test just going like, whoa. <laughs> like, you felt, you felt like it was, you f it, look at, I mean, look at this. Like, the, it's like the spitting image. It's unbelievable. And so the acting thing was something I never worried about ever because I know how dedicated he is and how what a skilled actor he is. But when I saw the look come together, that was something that was really special. The, one of the first times that we saw him, well, the first time we saw him in the full getup was was in the Live Aid um, footage. That's the first thing we shot. And that's so iconic. That's Freddie is most recognizable, you know, with the mustache and the slick back hair. And so it, that, res that gave us a buzz. But it wasn't just the physical resemblance that he brought onto set. He brought something, I think, of Freddie's kind of um, demeanor, you know, this celebration of life, this kind of um, fearlessness and... Uh, and I think he set the precedent. He was the most amazing leading man in that sense. He set the precedent for us all to feel that we can take risks, that we can um, really kind of, uh, you know, um, commit to this story, you know. And, and he was just an incredible leading man in that sense. I, I, think I joined it, the guys had already started filming the Live Aid section in the first couple of weeks. And when I came around the corner, I saw Rami first in, uh, as Freddie, and he was, and uh, all the movements and everything. And then I saw, the boys, and I was like, um, and it wasn't just Rami, all of them, the, the attention to detail as performers was inspiring. And then, you know, that day I went back to the hotel and was like, okay, you're going to have to up your game here to join these boys. And uh, it's always lovely when you go onto a job and know everyone is given 110%. And I did, really did feel that every day when we were on set. And as you say, the energy that Rami, but all of you guys brought, allowed us to play, to take chances. And I think that's very evident in the movie that we have. Yeah, you mentioned the uh, attention to detail. What were rehearsals like? Because those performances looked like real performances. Those were real shows you were putting on. Yeah, well, we started we started at the deep end because like uh, the live aid bit, you know, we, we got together for five weeks before filming started the band and um, we looked at that live aid footage en endlessly. Um, yeah, what, how many does it have 10 million views online? We're five million of them. Oh, without a doubt. Yeah, yeah, yeah without a doubt. Um, and, you know, we had an amazing movement uh, coach in the, uh, in the name uh, Polly Bennett. She was awesome. And we just looked at that footage and looked in meticulous detail like you know if if brian turned his head at a specific moment i had to copy that you know even the imperfections on the day so at the end of the concert there's a moment where brian waves to the crowd turns around to go up stage and walks into the microphone stand and you see it just in the background on the footage of live aid and polly was like well he did it on the day so you're gonna have to do it again on the day when we're filming it so I'm sorry, Brian, I, I had to, you know, yeah. have that embarrassing moment and repeat it uh, on film. But yeah, it was it was um, tough starting in that way. But in some ways, it was great to have something so specific to concentrate on. It's such an overwhelming prospect playing these parts. But to start with Live Aid, where you can just, you know, if you get a bit scared about this whole, the, the whole story, you can just go, OK, what was Brian doing in that specific moment on that day? Um, yeah. What I thought was amazing was, because it wasn't just Live Aid, there were so many of uh, performances captured in this movie. And you'd finish a scene and the guys would know in two days they had to do Top of the Pops, the Killer Queen. So as a non-playing member of the cast, it was kind of boring really, because you would go like, so I just like, oh, and they'd all go to their trailers, <laughs> Ben would put on the headphones and, he'd be doing, and, and you'd be doing the bass and the guitar and I'd be like, I'll just, I'm just gonna make tea. Uh, anyone want tea? I'll do a tea round for the boys. Yeah, <laughs> but they were dedication, like every minute they had, every waking minute when they weren't acting in a scene, they were practicing. Do you guys play any instruments or was it all just kind of learning some finger placements? We do now. You do now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, we, we played. We, we cared deeply about making sure that we were really playing these songs. We didn't want to fake it. We didn't want it to seem sort of like, you know, I don't know, you see sometimes like in movies where actors are playing like instruments and they're just like... <laughs> Like it's all face, you know what I mean? And they're just, their hands are doing anything. Um, and so we wanted to make sure we were really playing these songs. I had a small background in guitar. Um, when I found out I was close to getting the job, I went to my best friend, I was like, give me your bass. And I learned a couple of the easier songs. Um, and then when I got the job, yeah, they, again, the bringing us out five weeks early was also so that we could uh, hook up with guitar teachers. I, I worked with Paul Westwood, like the best studio bassist in England. And he was giving me lessons four or five days a week for five weeks. And then it didn't end there. You know, it was like a six-month shoot. 
And so we kept playing, like you were saying, like the concerts throughout all the way through. And, and it was, we had a nice moment near the end where we did the Another One Bites the Dust scene. And in that, it, it wasn't playback, right? So if, we, if you, like, typically if you're doing the performances, if you mess up, no one's gonna know because it's the playback, right? It's the recording, so you're fine. But this was like the creation of the song. And so the music director just said, hey, I'm gonna turn you on, you're live. And so in it, like, I had to really play on the day. And then Gwil was like, well, I'm gonna play too then. And so he plugged in and then he started going and Ben's always playing the drums because you can see all of that. And, and then Rami sort of came up to me and so said, hey, um, when do you want me to come in with the lyric? And I just said, I'll just go off of your cue. And it was like, oh my goodness, we're a band. Like, we're an actual band I was like, right so now. you guys turned yeah. into Queen. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and that was a moment where it was just so cool, where I'm just like, you know, I'm just playing that intro until my lead singer comes in and boom, and then we know where we are in the song. And, and it was just a moment that felt like all the hard work had paid off, you know, because we actually got to hear ourselves play and like do it. It was pretty cool. And from the viewer standpoint, that scene was really cool to watch. So it's nice yeah. to know the backstory. Yeah. Uh, before we go to audience questions, what is something that you learned about Queen or Freddie Mercury that you just were surprised about and didn't know before? That I was uh, in every single one, uh, every member of that band has written a number one single at some point. And that says so much about them. They all they were all so incredibly talented in their own right, but together as a unit, they uh, had something special, I think. Yeah, I mean, for, for me, it was that, you know, I described John as like an accidental rock star. He did not intend to be in a huge band. He just was doing it on the weekends, basically, just like for fun. Like, he's like, yeah, I like music. So like, you know. Every once in a while, I'll go out and play with you guys. And then before you knew it, he was in the biggest band of all time and writing number one hit songs. And it's just like such a funny journey into this band that I, it always just struck me as like such a great sort of detail about a rock star. Like you, it's, it wasn't his dream. Like you never hear anything like that. I think the same. I think that the fact there's so many incredible happy accidents that had to occur for Queen to, to be Queen. And uh, it's definitely captured in the movie, the fact that there's so many things that could have gone just slightly differently and you wouldn't have the band or the music that you have today. I think our audience has a few questions. So who do we have first? Uh, what kind of uh, detailed research did you do to capture psych psychological profile of each character and to play them well? <laughs> do you want to start that one, Joe? Um, oh. You're asking about how to get into the mind, basically, of these guys? Well, it's just homework. It's just, that's what it comes down to, right? Like, it starts with something very simple. For me, it was John squints a lot, right? So I just started there, like, kind of, like, closing my eyes, and his lip sort of comes out a little bit. Okay, so now I've got the face down. Okay, so that's a start. Well, then I have to learn the dialect. I'd never heard this accent before in my life. It's like an East Midlands English accent, but I was just like, okay. Uh, and so then it's about getting that down and understanding his cadences and, and the, sort of the way he speaks. And, and, and from the, once you have some of those things down, then you can sort of start ad-libbing a little bit, right? We, we were given a lot of leeway on set to sort of just come up with things on the fly and banter and have band moments. And, and so then once you kind of have his voice down, you understand sort of the way he speaks and you see that you're a little bit freer to like know sort of how to, I don't know, go back and forth with the other band members. Um, and it's basically just about taking all the information you have, right? Like you have the interviews, you have the performances, you have the stories from the band, um, and you just take, that's like your template, right? And you start there. And for all the private moments, you just have to like sort of take from all of those things and then bring it to life in the way that you feel that they would emote or that they would react to something. And so you have to bring some of yourself in there and that's sort of that, that's the acting portion, right? Where like you have to make it feel real and make it feel truthful within, within the boundaries of who John Deacon is or who the other guys are. And so, um, yeah, but it starts with getting all that homework done and then it makes your life a lot easier when you have to come up with what they would do in a situation. Next question. Hi. Um, so my question is, what, do, um, if any, what do you think is the overall message of the film that people, both fans of Queen and people who aren't necessarily as um, like knowledgeable about the band or their music will get coming to this film? I think Queen were always a band that like, they had the courage of their convictions. They knew like, they knew they had something special and they, they weren't, 
kind of constrained by trying to fit in with what critics thought or, or trying to fit into a specific genre. They um, really kind of committed to uh, their individuality, I suppose. Freddie, as well as an, as an individual, you know, he was an immigrant child who was who was bullied as a child for his for having the teeth that he had, and who spent his life struggling with his sexuality and his identity, and you know, he's he's the celebrated, you know, his individuality in that sense, and I think that's why he, when he goes out on a stage in front of seventy thousand people, he can really make it feel as though he's speaking to every individual in the crowd, you know and speaking to their, like, um, their individuality as well and, and saying, you know, it's okay to be who you are, you know, whatever that might be. If you're struggling to find out who you are, then, you know, celebrate it, actually. And I hope that when you come out of the cinema, you do get a sense of that, that joy and that feeling of, um, you know, having the confidence to be who you want to be, I think. That's what my takeaway was. I really enjoyed seeing him in those private moments and seeing how different he was on stage and at home. And I think it was just showed every kid that's watching that it's okay to be who you are. Yeah. And last question. Hi, this question is for Joel and Alan. How difficult is it to switch roles? Because when I see you, I still see Sledge. And when I see you, I still see Branson. And I can't get that out of my mind. So how difficult is it to get into these roles as opposed to not really being typecast, but how people may most identify you? I think, uh, well, I imagine the two of us feel the same. When you play a character that has been on TV and people feel very associated with you, the chance to play something completely different is, is the excitement and the challenge because you want to make sure that it is something completely different. So I think that I find the greatest challenge is to get out of the mannerisms that you've learned over six years, playing one character. And obviously that comes down to, as again, research. Um, so I, I find that you, if you can find something that's completely different from what you've done before, that's always the greatest challenge for me. Yeah, like the great thing about being an actor is that you get to sort of live out the dream, the other dreams that you had, you know, in your life. And so like, this job is such a no-brainer, right? Like, you get to be a rock star in, like, the biggest band ever. Um, and so it, you you relish that. You relish a new challenge. The Pacific was a, probably the biggest one I've ever had and the biggest one I ever will have. Um, and getting out of that role, typically getting for me, getting out of roles is actually pretty easy. I actually like to just leave it between action and cut and just sort of be myself when I'm like off camera or whatever and stay relaxed and have fun and that's how I feel like I do my best work. The Pacific was difficult to do that. I, I That one stuck with me for months after. Um, and so that was probably the, the hardest challenge I ever had of like leaving that role and like going into the next. This one is a, so, such a joy that it's more like I don't want to. Um, not, you know what I mean? And, and like, I will like be driving in my car and looking at street signs and sort of slip into John Deacon's accent to like read the signs to myself, like when I'm driving or something like that. But, um, you know, I, it, like you were saying though, it's, it's why you do this, right. To, to kind of stretch yourself and, and see like how many different versions of yourself you can be. And, um, it's, this was a very fun one. It was a fun one to watch as well, and I think that fans of Queen will resonate with the film, but I also think it's going to bring in a lot of new fans that are just going to be so curious about this crazy rock band that they didn't know that much about. So thank you guys for the work you did. If you guys want to check out Bohemian Rhapsody, it's out Friday, November 2nd. Thank you, Gwilym Lee, Joe Mazzello, and Alan Leach. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys.